the doctrine of humanity. I, because I didn't have a lot of room here, I used the doctrine of man. Again, uh, Gerudo makes a, a strong defense about why we should call it the doctrine of man. Um, I, I don't disagree with him, but I don't see the necessity of that. Uh, you know, all other things being equal, unless there was some real strong biblical mandate that it had to be the doctrine of man, I would rather use humanity simply for the inclusion, because women are included in this too. Even though Origen, early on, Origen had to had to really think about it, and he finally decided, yes, women can be saved too. Women have a soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you need to know that most scholars who have looked at this say that the the apostolic times, the times when the apostles were still alive, and probably even the immediate apostolic fathers after them, women were considered to have a much more prominent role in the church. It was only when the post-apostolic fathers came along that, that a, and in fact it's called, the study of this is called patristics, and there's kind of a, you know, the maternal, a paternalistic kind of approach to that, that women actually started being limited down to the point where Origen had to decide whether they really had souls or not. Um, so, the doctrine of man or the doctrine of humanity, it really is Christian anthropology. In fact, the question we're asking here is what does it mean to be human in the light of a belief in God? Now, anthropology is one of the studies of the liberal arts. <clears throat> anthropology means the study of humanity, and especially it means a comparative study of physical and social characteristics of humanity down through the ages in different places. What were cultures like in the ancient Near East versus cultures in Africa, etc.? You know, how did they dress? What was their religion? That's what anthropology is concerned with. The comparative study of people down through the ages in different locations. But theological anthropology, actually it's, it's the only part of it that's the same is the people part. But it's much bigger than that. Theological anthropology is the study of humanity, which is what anthropology means. Anthropos is humanity, it's, it's, it's a man, uh, um, anthros. And logos, of course, is the study of, it literally is word in Spanish, but it, uh, in uh, Spanish, in um, Greek, but it is the study of man. So anthropology, theological anthropology differs because it's a study of humanity as humanity relates to God. So there is God in the picture when we talk about theological anthropology, and particularly in terms of our flavor, Christian anthropology. It's what does it mean to be human in light of a belief in God? If God is there, what, do, what additional part do we need to understand about how we relate to God? Especially, how are we made in the image of God, and what difference does that make? Okay? Um, the, as we, my, my preaching teacher, Ian Pitt Watson, the greatest preacher I ever heard, um, he said that the proper, the proper task of preaching, because it's the proper task of our Christian understanding, and it's the, it's the actual purpose of the Bible, is to tell us about God, and to tell us about us, what is the nature of humanity, and then how do those two things fit together? So preaching is an act of speaking of the things of God, but applying it to the reality of human life, and then drawing some conclusions about both of those, how both of those realities come together. That's what I always try to do when I preach. Um, we speak of God and of His Word, we speak of humanity and the reality of our existence, and we talk about what those two, how those two things fit together. And that's what theological anthropology is. It's, it's, it's more the focus on what people are, and what our realities are, and what we're made of, but it's theological in that it says all of those things in light of a belief that God is real, and that He made us. Okay? Does that make sense? From the very earliest of the patristic fathers, you know, Gregory of Nyssa, and then especially Augustine in the 400s, um, they, they recognized the need, Augustine more than any other, uh, recognized the need for us to have a clear theological understanding about us, in addition to a clear theological understanding about God. Who are we? What are we? What, how are we made? Why are we made? What does that mean? And so Augustine, in fact, Augustine believed that humanity, human beings, were the perfect union of two substances, body and soul. And he used the analogy of a marriage. As a husband and wife become one flesh, a body and soul become one person. And so understanding the nature of that is critical. So, in theological anthropology, there are a number of questions which are typical of a theological or a Christian anthropological uh, study. First, how did humanity come into being? How did we get here? Second, what does it mean 
that we say that humanity was made in the image of God, which is one of the basic principles, tenets, doctrines of the Christian faith. That we are made in the image of God. Well, what does that mean? How are we made in the image of God? Third, for what purpose was humanity created? You know, we get into very big metaphysical questions in theological anthropology that what is the purpose of humanity? You know, what's, what's the reason for human existence? Um, fourth, of what is humanity made? What are we made of? You know, are we diesel and dust, like the rock and rollers would say? Are we, you know, what, what is it that makes us uniquely what we are? What are the, what are the components? And then, related to that, I mean, the, number four is sort of what's the substance from which we're made. Number five is of what parts do we consist? And particularly, we've touched on this in the past, is there a difference in soul and spirit? If you've never thought about that, then you're obviously a dichotomist, whether you do it or not. And we'll talk about that. There are different understandings of what are the component parts of people. I think we even touched on that a little bit. Did we talk about that a little bit last week? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, we talked about it pre in previous, you know, last term, and then probably a little bit under our New Testament theology classes. And then, fifth, what is the destiny of humanity, and what affects that destiny? Where are we going to end up? You know, and what and why? How does that work? Number six, we are not going to address today, other than acknowledging that that is one of the questions that theological anthropology typically asks. You know, what's our future? Because we're going to deal with that next week when we talk about sin and redemption. We will get into the issue of, of the immortality of the soul and what affects that. I, I, again, as we go along today, I may mention a little bit. There's two, two distinct doctrines regarding the immortality of the soul, and the non-orthodox one is gaining a lot of ground these days. The orthodox understanding of the soul is what's called inherent immortality, meaning from the moment God creates us, our souls, those souls will live forever. That there is inherent in our souls, our, our our immaterial spiritual side, that uh, a, an eternal existence once God creates us. And the question is, where will that eternity be spent? Okay. But more and more, there is an increase in a belief in what's called a conditional immortality of the soul, meaning that it's conditional because God can award us eternal life for our souls, that we could live forever, but that's not inherent. It is a conditional thing, and if God doesn't grant it to us, then those who are not, um, who do not have eternal life, who do not, not accept in Christ, will spend a time in hell, but then will be destroyed. It's called annihilation, because there is an inherent eternity in their souls. They're only conditionally eternal. Okay, a lot more theologians and churches are beginning to believe that. That's the one that the Unitarian Universalist loves. Okay, because either either the soul is going to go away, be annihilated, or everybody's going to get saved. Everybody gets to be saved. Everybody gets to be saved. That's an over joke. If you haven't seen it, everybody gets car. Everybody gets car. Okay. Oh, you people. <laughs> is it run? Is it uh, uh, backed up by Rob Bell? I don't know Rob Bell. Okay. Yeah. Is he the? I believe so. I've read. I've read about that. Is is he? He's, he's a contemporary uh, mainstream media type. Yeah, oh, he was a pastor of a big church. Now he's not, but yeah. he proposes that universalism. Yeah, I've heard his name, but I don't, I don't know anything about it. So but that's okay. Yeah, you're not missing much. <laughs> so, and again, either the idea is that everybody, you know, souls will live forever because God lets them, but it's 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 conditional that they live forever, or they don't live forever. They suffer for a limited period of time in hell, and then they're annihilated. That's conditional immortality. That immortality is only uh, a characteristic of the, the human soul or spirit if God gives it to you, but he's not going to give it to everybody. But that's not the traditional Christian doctrine. The traditional, you know, scripture says, you know, some will be resurrected to eternal, you know, to, uh, to heaven, and some will be uh, resurrected to eternal condemnation. Yes, uh, for it first. Uh, didn't you mention uh, a while back that everything is energy that you can never destroy? No, everything is either, you can never destroy matter or energy. Right. You know, the conservation of matter and energy. There's the two different principles, what they usually talk about them is the conservation of matter and energy. Yes? So, isn't that a physical form goes back to whatever form, but isn't there still the, the energy that's... Is, I, I'm just trying to understand what they're saying by particle. Well, 
the, the idea that the soul isn't inherently eternal. It's only eternal if God lets it be. Okay. Now, how that how they would apply the concept, you know, the conservation of energy to that, the energy being the soul, I don't know. I don't know if they thought. About that. Okay. Yes. What scriptures are they using to back that up? I don't know that they have any. It's wishful thinking, yes. like so much bad wishful theology thinking. is wishful thinking. <laughs> I don't like that, so I'm going to come up with something else. I mean, there's stuff in scripture I don't like. You know, very simply, the idea of eternal condemnation is not high on my list of priority. I mean, there are things I like, but it's in scripture, and so I can't go away with it. All right? So these are the questions we're going to address. We're not going to get into number six today in any detail, but we will talk about it in two weeks in our next class, which is in two weeks, not next week. Okay? Let's take these one at a time. First, how do we believe, or how do we understand from Scripture, that humanity came into being? We first have to simply say right up front, and, and with, with all the energy we have available to us, that Judaism and Christianity both insist that humanity did not come into existence by accident or chance, but rather as an intentional act created by an all-powerful God as the high point of His work in creating the universe. He made all the... All all of the created universe, and then he made us as the highest level, the one, the one part of his creation with whom he could be in a relationship. It is not um, in any way accidental. Now, we don't know exactly how God did it, and we have to have some humility about that. And there are a number of different theistic ideas, or theistic uh, beliefs. Theistic meaning God did it, but different ideas about how exactly he did it. <clears throat> did he do it over a long period of time? Did he do it in, you know, in seven, six days? Yeah, there are very different ideas about that. But fundamentally, and, and you know what? It's okay to have some different ideas about those things. Anybody who says that if you don't believe in six literal 24-hour days of creation, then you're damned to hell, get over it. That is not a condition of salvation to believe that. And anybody who says that needs to take a humility pill. Because we don't know for sure. The thing we do know for sure is that however he did it, God did it. It was not an accident. It was not a chance. It was not a random gathering of amino acids that turned into protein, that turned into one cell you know, animals, and, and that it all just happened by chance. We believe God did it. Okay. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. We believe God made us. All right? That's the most fundamental thing. And you know what? I'm gonna, at the end of today, I'm going to talk about the horrendous consequences of not believing that's true. Because I will go so far as to say every major wrong direction that humanity has gone in the last 200 years has been a result of the fact that our theological anthropology was messed up, ultimately that we did not have a conception of the nature of humanity being created by God. Every one of them, and I'll give you a list in a bit. Okay, Terry. Just one uh, comment. I, <clears throat> the one word, or the high point, like there's all kinds of studies that have been research that's coming forward now saying that it's highly probable there's life in other galaxies, and I mean the last two years, there's more and more detail of that. So just the word highest point, I mean uh, a high point, not necessarily the yeah. high point. I mean, no. We, we don't know that either, as, as I understand it. From everything that we know, we are. I mean, if some other data comes along and, and we have evidence that God created life in another place, then we may need to modify that. But until we do actually know that, this is true. Okay? We believe this to be true because this is what Scripture says. Now, um, I, I I think it'd be kind of really exciting to find out God had also done work in other places. Have you guys read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy? Okay. If you haven't, you should. Especially if you grew up liking science fiction. Because C.S. Lewis wrote science fiction, too. The three-part Space Trilogy. Out of the Silo Planet, Paralandra, and that hideous strength. And in it, he has his main character, who is the, the redemptive figure in all this, whose name is Ransom traveling against his will initially to other planets and discovering that God had creative works there as well. It looks very different than here, but all of it ties together in terms of an understanding in these books that God is still the same God and he did create. And his pattern of creating and of, of loving and of 
being providentially involved in is the same there as here. So it may turn out that's true. And I don't have heartburn with saying it may turn out it's true, but until we find out for sure it's true, this is still a true statement. There? Regardless, God formed man from the dust. Exactly. Right. Exactly. 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 Yeah. So, no question about that. I mean, the, the issue is, can we claim to be the high point of his work? Well, there are a few people I know that... But no, the man is... The scripture says that God made us uniquely to be in relationship with him. He made us in, uniquely in his image. No other being, not even the angels, are made in the image of God. And so that's why we, ident we are identified in scripture as being the high point of his creation. The, you know, the, ultimate, the, 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 the ultimate expression of his creative act. Okay? So that's one thing. We came into being because God created us. Even though we have to have humility about not knowing exactly all the details. Right? Secondly, the question, what does it mean that humanity was made in the image of God? Um, he made us, and he made us in his image, it says. Well, what does that mean? How are we? I mean, some people think they are little gods. <laughs> Newsflash, you're not. <laughs> if you think you are divine or you are, you know, you've, you've bought this new age bull about finding the God that is within you, I'm sorry, you are not divine. You don't have a God in you. You are a created being. All right? So what does it mean that we are in the image of God? It means that we were created to resemble God, to be like God in some ways. And that's not in our material, physical, flesh and blood kind of body. Scripture is very clear that God is spirit. John 4, 24 said God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God does not have a physical body. The incarnation of Jesus... When he literally put on flesh, carne, was a unique act of God's providential action in the world. That does not mean that God, by nature, has a physical body. He doesn't. Angels don't have physical bodies either by nature. They are immaterial built, uh, creatures unless they need a body in order to fulfill some assignment, in which case God will give them one. When the angels appeared to the shepherds and you know to various other people, um, they, had a, they had a physical appearance because they needed to in order to be able to do their job of communicating with people about something God wanted to know. But God is spirit. The angels also, just as a sidebar, are non-material beings. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us, note the plural, God is a plural in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is not talking to the angels. We are not made in the image of the angels. God is speaking to himself when he says us. Because he is in himself a community of beings. Three persons in one. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This also tells us there is a female aspect to God. Quite frequently, that is associated with the Holy Spirit, although we don't have any scriptural support for that, simply because the Holy Spirit is the one who comforts and cares for and encourages and teaches a role that we humans, you know, quite often see women are better at that stuff than men are, to men's great disgrace. You know. uh, but God is the Trinity, three persons in one. We are made in his image, male and female made in his image. So there is a female aspect to God. Right? Yes. Seems to say that, right? Any questions about that? John? So, um, with, in the statement, we're made to resemble God, in, uh, but, not, but in our immaterial selves, which could be your soul or your spirit or both, that sort of thing. Right. Wouldn't it... Would, would it Help me with this. Um, is is the is the similarity only in the in the existence of soul and spirit, or would it be also with the purity of the soul and spirit? And if that's so, then the question that would follow that up is: Are we now in the image of God? Mm -hmm. We are now because. Um, you basically are saying the moral aspect. You know, Adam and Eve were created morally pure and righteous before they made the decision that introduced sin into their lives and into our lives as well. But 
they were made morally pure prior to that decision. And that, that is one of the ways in which they were made in the image of God. When sin entered into the world, we lost that moral purity, that inherent righteousness. But we retained enough of the image of God that we are still moral creatures. We have the ability to recognize right from wrong. We don't always use that ability. But we do have the ability to know right from wrong, and we have the ability to choose right or wrong in a way that no other creature, no other created part of, of the universe does. As I've said this before. People will say, oh, I came home and my dog, you know, he had his ears laid back and he's really embarrassed, and he, he knew he'd done something wrong. Actually, he did not know he had done something wrong because that would make him a moral creature. What he knew was he did something he could get punished for. Right? Something that was not going to make you happy. That's not the same thing as deciding this was a wrong thing, I shouldn't have done it. That's not the same as this is something I'm going to get in trouble for. Okay? You understand that difference? And so, we are still moral creatures because we have the ability to recognize and the ability to choose right from wrong, although we often choose the wrong. And let me get into that a little bit because continuing with this, this question, you know, we are made to resemble God. And I, I, we are not equal to God in, in no way. God does not create another God. If he did, then he would no longer be the God. But he did create us in a number of different ways, especially we are made in the image of God, and, and this is a, we could be more expansive than this, mentally, morally, and socially. These are three aspects of humanity that is in the image of God that no other beings are in quite the same way. First, mentally. We are sentient. Sentient means we're self-aware. I can identify myself as a unique being as apart from other beings. I have an awareness of myself that no other being does. Well, I mean, we have an awareness of ourselves. It's not like I'm saying that's just me. Um, human Humanity is sentient, self-aware. And whenever they talk about uh, artificial intelligence in, you know, you've seen the science fiction movies, I assume. The place where you get in trouble is where the machines become self-aware. Sentient. That's the whole Terminator thing. You know, Skynet? Skynet, at some point, the artificial intelligence of Skynet becomes self-aware, sentient, and starts making moral decisions. The reason that that plot works is because, as of now, there is no other self-aware or sentient being other than human beings. No animal, no machine, no nothing. Right? Or else those movies wouldn't work. Okay. Um, so we are sentient, we are rational, we have the ability to use reason to evaluate options. We are volitional agents, we can choose our actions in a way that lesser animals can't. Other animals are driven by natural motivations of hunger, of thirst, of sex drive, of something else. Well, we are volitional agents in the sense that we can make decisions even contrary to our natural urges in a way that no other animal can. And we are capable of intellectual reflection and of creativity. Nobody can love their dog more than I love my dog, and yet my dog does not sit around and consider whether Plato or Aristotle was more right. <laughs> okay, no matter how smart your dog is, they're not intellectually capable of reflection in the same way that human beings are. Nor are they able to express creativity in the same way. They, it used to be that one of the definitions for the difference between human, and human beings and other creatures is that human beings, for instance, were the only ones who made tools. Now, they've discovered that a crow actually will bend a piece of wire in order to use it for something, which is, which is making a tool, which makes crows scary little critters. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a joke thing on the internet for a while, Carol, and used to talk about where it was this campaign. The crows were so smart they were having a campaign and it was, we want to be your only bird. <laughs> well, but other, you know, the, the very fact that that's so extraordinary is because it's extraordinary by its exception. For the most part, with that, that's the only exception I know of. I mean, people say that chimpanzees will use a, you know, a stick or a, a, a straw to get ants out of an anthill, you know, to eat or whatever. Well, that's using something as a tool. It's not making or fashioning a tool. Crow, finally, they found one doing that. But anyway... Um, we have creativity that you know, goes to the stars. 
not just making tools, but coming up with creative solutions for things, you know, uh, inventing makeup to, you know, to increase the beauty in the world, all the different things that human beings do, all of which is a rearranging of materials in the world to, to, in a way that we find more attractive, but still, no other animal does that. No other, and you, they say, well, elephants paint. I'm sorry, but elephants splash paint on a canvas. That's not the same thing, right? Um, you, you get that? You understand what I mean by that? That the mental capabilities of human beings are not just different in scale, they are different in type beyond any other creature. And in those regards, we are similar to God. We resemble God because God is sentient, self-aware. He is rational. There is reason. He gave us this book. Um, the old thing about if you set a monkey down on a typewriter, eventually he would come out with the Bible or or Shakespeare. No, he wouldn't. I mean, unless, unless you're talking about just random chance, which says nothing about the monkey or about Shakespeare, if it's just random, and how long is that going to take? Okay. So, no, there's a difference in terms of rationality, of volition, choice. Again, only human beings will make choices in direct contradiction to their own natural urges and best interest for higher values. Okay? God does that. Remember Jesus going to the cross? For us, for a higher value, he went against his own best interest. And also intellectual reflection and creativity. Yes? Um, in the image of God, uh, no mention of anger or jealousy, which is also in, in uh, God's makeup. Well, and yeah, ours. Exactly. It's in ours. God's anger and God's jealousy is, is, it's almost just unfortunate that we use the same word for that. Because God's anger and God's jealousy is fundamentally different than our anger or jealousy. God is the, only, is the only being who has a right to be jealous. Because he's the only one who's God. God is the only one who has truly just anger. You know, his anger is a righteous and holy and justified anger. And ours almost never is. I mean, there are some exceptions to that, but almost never is. Our jealousy and our anger is almost always uh, purely selfish. Um, and... You could say God is selfish, but God is the only one who has a right to be selfish because He's the only one who is God. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. We use the same word, but it's almost fundamentally different kinds of things. All right. So mentally, then morally, and this is what I think you were getting at, John. In our original state, Adam and Eve, they were righteous. They were morally pure. There was no sin, and in that way, they were very much in the image of God. And even after the fall, we still retain an aspect of that morality so that we know right from wrong. And we can choose right from wrong. More often than not, we choose wrong. And the further down, we talked about this in our Roman st uh, Bible study today, uh, Paul talks about the further down the wrong road we go toward the things of sin and evil, the more we let sin master us, the less we are able to make moral choices. The less we are able, the less power we have to make right choices. But still, in our nature, we have moral awareness and moral volition. We can choose right from wrong. That is not true of any other created being. Again, all other creatures are driven by their personal motivation, uh, their, their, uh, their natural urges, if you will, of one kind or another. That doesn't mean they're not cute, but they, they're not going to decide them, you know, um, and, and, and you could say, well, what about a dog who sacrifices himself to save his owner? Well, even in that case, and, and we, you know, we want to attribute nobility to that, and I do, it's simply a matter that their, their natural senses were a sense of protection of one that is their protector. Okay? And it is very much more a natural urge. There, is not, there, there isn't the same kind of nobility to it that we might feel. John? I've heard it said that we today are really not formed in the image of God. We are formed in the image of Adam, who lost it all. He was formed in the image of God, in his moral perfection and all of these attributes that were given to him to rule over the earth. And when sin came in, it really killed him. And death entered in, and it, it did more than just alter the, the, the morality of men. It, Killed the morality of, of men, and and 
Paul makes it clear that from that point on, that was transferred, that whatever effect that was, and he calls it death, was transferred to all generations. Right. How would you respond to that? I mean, you know, would, would, would it be incorrect to say, or correct to say, we now are really products of Adam? And that what that does, I would think, would be illuminate the value of the new birth and put it in its right posture of mm -hmm. what that means. It's not just going to heaven. It is it is redeeming what was lost in, in there. So is that, is that right or wrong? Or? Well, there's an aspect of that that has some truth to it, which it relates to the bondage of the will, uh, and, uh, and which Luther wrote on the bondage of the will, Calvin wrote on that issue, which means that our will is so fallen and so broken we cannot choose the right ultimately unless God allows us to, unless God calls us. You know, no one comes unless God calls them first. Um, and so the bondage of the will comes into that. But we are still made in the image of God. Um, it is a brokenness. There's a brokenness to that image. And you are right. We are heirs to Adam. And we inherited all of that stuff. But we also inherited the fundamental aspects that Adam had. You know, we didn't lose our sentience. We didn't lose our volitional, you know, morality. We didn't lose. We can still choose right or wrong. Um, we didn't lose our rationality. We didn't lose our creativity. All of those things which are still in the image of God. It's almost as though, um, you know, I, I could break my arm and it would not be able to be uh, useful for me in the same way, but it's still my arm. Okay? We're still in the image of God even though that image is broken and it does not work in the same way that it should. It doesn't have the strength that it should. <clears throat> But we still are in His image. There is still the image of God in each of us. That little, fl that for some it's flicker. For the great saints of the, of the of the faith, it has been a bonfire inside them, which is the image of God in us, and it's reflected in these ways. So I would not agree that we are no longer in the image of God, but only in the image of Adam, because we still have the characteristics that God gave Adam that make us in His image. There is a question as to, and, and there's disagreement theologically on. How broken are we with regard to our ability to choose the ultimate right, our ability to choose God? And that gets into election versus free will. You know, Reformed theology, and Luther agreed with this, by the way, even though he wasn't a Reformed theologian, that our will is so broken that it is in bondage and is unable to choose the right unless God intercedes and permits us to choose the right. When I say the right, I don't mean choosing an, an immediate right or wrong. Should I, you know... Should I, tell that, should I tell that person they're ugly and their mother, mother dresses them funny, or shouldn't I? Okay? Um, that's an immediate choice that's a right or wrong. But the question is, choosing God, returning to God in repentance and humility and accepting His forgiveness, do we have the ability in our natural selves to do that? Or is our will so broken and so much in bondage that we are not able to do that unless God calls us? I'm a Reformed theologian. I believe we are not able to find God unless He calls us. Unless he chooses us and calls us to himself. Luther agreed with that. Calvin agreed with that. Most of the people up until Jacob, Jacob Arminius agreed with that. Yes? Just to understand that if that's the, what is it, the gravity? I can't remember. Right. right. Okay, but th th that's only in relation to basically getting saved. As far as making good moral decisions, you can still do that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's an immediacy of moral volition that we still have. I mean, I can decide whether or not to shoot somebody. Right. Okay, there is nothing broken, so broken in me that I don't have that choice. I don't care how much of a criminal I've been. Now again, as we get addicted to sin, it makes it harder for us to make good choices. And Paul talks about that in Romans 6. You know, as you, as you allow sin to be your master, it is harder then to step back from that. But that always still, their potential is there for you to decide not to kill somebody, not to rob somebody, you know, not to pump heroin into my veins. I can choose that. Um, so yes, we have an immediacy of moral volition, but the question is, when it comes to the ultimate choice of returning to God, you know, of, of getting past our, our spiritual brokenness, then that's where some theologians disagree. And as a Reformed theologian, I believe in the bondage of the will, that only if God calls us are we able to do that. My, my conflict is, I believe that too, and that does not reflect the image of God. My, my, my rebellion against Him is such that I can't I can't say that's the image of God in me. 
I see the I see the I see the, um, the the tools that we're talking about here, the mental capacity, the moral capacity, mm -hmm. and all that. I see that tool there. But when I look at the depravity, and if right. I understand it correctly, then I can't I cannot address that as being in the image of God. Yeah. You know, that's why I, I would wonder, you know, what Okay. Can I, if I, if I understand what you're saying, or you're saying that it's impossible for the flesh to produce the righteousness of God, sure. and which is in I agree agreement with, with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Only the flesh still can choose some right, and right is in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Well, the, even the ability to choose moral is, yeah. is in the image of God, because no other creature has moral moral right. awareness or moral volition. Okay. Right. Um, and so there are there are there are ways we're in the image of God, and you know. So let's look at the third one. Socially, we are image in the image of God socially, which means we are created for relationship in a deeper and more intimate way than any other created being. Initially and especially with God, God made us in His image so we could be in a relationship with Him. But there's also an aspect in which our uh, our potential for a relationship with other people is at a depth and an intimacy that no other creature shares. And people say, oh, well, you know, great white sharks mate for life. <laughs> yeah, oh, what, that, what does that mean? I mean, what is the level of intimacy that they experience? <coughs> um, so th there is a sense in which socially we are different in kind, not just in degree from other animals. Okay? So those are the ways we understand. And I, we could go on. I mean, we could list other things. There, the creativity, and you know, I mentioned, I suggest here, and other ways. Um, again, I really like Wayne Grudem, and Caroline were talking about that. I especially like the fact that he has a very spiritual, you know, perspective on his writing, in terms of the devotional aspect to it and all that. But um, he starts out by saying that you can't really talk about the particular ways in which we're in God's image. You can only say we're in His image and likeness. And then four pages later, he starts listing all the ways in which we're made in the image of God. And I'm going, well, why did you have to say that first part? <laughs> okay, if you're going to get here anyway. Um, it, it, it reminded me, I worked for American Leprosy uh, Mission, a Canadian Leprosy Mission. An American Leprosy Mission got a new president. And he was a doctor, and he said that we're never going to use the word leprosy again because internationally that has such a negative connotation. And he, he said we're never going to do it. And I... I I and the guy I was working for at that time said, you have to say leprosy because if you don't, nobody's going to give you any money if you call it Hansen's disease. Actually, Carol has a story when she was like in the fourth grade. Her teacher said, okay, you should never use the word leprosy. You always need to use the word Hansen's disease. And Carol raised her hand and said, I would prefer you use the word leprosy. <laughs> her last name was Hansen. Well, this guy said this, and he said, I don't care if we lose 90% of our money. Well, in a few years, three, five years, he'd almost succeeded, so the board fired him. I understand he went to a conference and he said a woman, he was speaking at the conference and his whole talk was about how we can never use the word leprosy anymore. And a woman who's considered the world authority, the primary person working in ministry to leprosy victims around the world, raised her hand and she said, she said, Dr. Chris, I have a question for you. When you tell someone you work to help cure Hansen's disease and they say, what is that? What do you tell them? That's <laughs> great. Leprosy. So I, I felt that when I was reading through it. Why did you have to go there? Okay. Did you have a, something, Joe? No. Okay. Okay, sorry for that little sidebar. But um, so we there are ways in which we're made in the image of God that no other creature is. Even though we do have bondage in the world. Okay. Um, so the next question, for what purpose were we made? For what purpose was humanity created? Okay. Now, here we can quote the first question and answer of the Shorter Catechism of the Westminster Confession. The question of, this, of the Catechism of the Westminster Confession, the Shorter Catechism, is what is the chief end of man, which means the purpose? Why were we made? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The best question and answer on this topic ever offered. We were made to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Now, don't ever make the mistake, well, I'll give you a verse then, and I'll say this. Um, th and this is where it's taking us. Everything else is leading up to this passage in, in Revelations 21. 
Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Ultimately, us being made to glorify God and enjoy him will have a very practical conclusion where we will live in the presence of God, free from all of the grief and pain that we currently experience. He, we, he will be in our midst. We will be with Him. We will be in fellowship with Him, glorifying Him and enjoying Him forever in the absence of all the things that currently distract us from that. Okay? Um, now, we need, to make a, we need to make sure we don't make two mistakes, which are very common, human beings being the proud creatures we are, the first one is, I've actually heard people preach that God needed us. That God made us because he needed a creature to be in fellowship with. That is not true. God did not need us. God has no need. He has never felt a need. We'll talk about, you know, um, for what purpose a little bit more in a minute. God did it not because he needed to, but because he wanted to. He did it for his good pleasure. Don't ever let anybody tell you that God needs us. That God's sitting around lonely on his throne in heaven all by himself. Waiting for people to call him. Oh, do you know the song, What If God Were One of Us? What if God were one of us, you know, um, just a stranger on the bus? You know, uh, and it talks about, you know, what if God is just waiting for us to call? God doesn't need us. God is not lonely. He is a community within his own self. So that's not why he made us. It's also true, linked to that, is God did not create us as his peers. We are not God's mates, no matter what Crocodile Dundee says. We are not creatures who can come to God as equals. He is God and we are not. His ways are not our ways. He is as far from us as the heavens. He is our Father. He is imminent to us, close to us, but he is our Father in heaven. So he is different than us, transcendent. And this idea that has been very common in modern theology, part, and it's one of the reasons that we've led to this, the God that is inside you kind of thing, is that we've emphasized the eminence, the closeness of God, to the exclusion of the transcendence, the holy otherness of God. We are not God's peers, or his equals, or his buddies, or his mates. He is God and we are not. Okay? Fair? Fair. Yeah. And yet... He made us first, as I said, for his good pleasure, simply because it gave him pleasure to create, and especially, apparently, to create us, although sometimes it's hard to see that. <laughs> God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, meaning he took pleasure in it. This is the statement at the end, several times through the creation story in Genesis 1. It says God saw it, and it was good. At the end, he says he looked at all of it, and it was very good. God took pleasure in it. So he made us, as he did all creation, for the pure pleasure of it. And we can understand that. We take pleasure in creativity as well. Even if it's simply rearranging your furniture. So people say, oh, I'm not creative. Yes, you are. You may have had it beaten out of you when you were a kid that you, to the idea that you were creative. But if you choose a color for your, your living room or if you buy a new car for particular reasons, whatever you do, that is creative, and you do creative things, you do them because you find pleasure. And most especially if you paint, or you sculpt, or you you know, you know design houses, or whatever. We do it for pleasure. That's one of the other ways we're making the image of God. Creativity gives us pleasure, as it did God. Okay? We also were created that we might be in a relationship with God, that we might love Him and glorify Him. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy of our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. That very expression of praise to God, of glory to God, of recognition of, of the fact that He is worthy of that, is an act of relationship. God made us in His image so that we might be in relationship with Him in a way that no other creature could share, not even the angels, because the angels are not made in the image. And so, we are made to be in relationship with Him, to love Him, to glorify Him. And third, we were created to be stewards of creation. There's several passages that relate to this. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. 
Well, it's all the garden. You know, we have an obligation to care for creation. We are the highest level of creation, and so we have a responsibility to care for all of the rest of it that's around us. And people who, uh, you know, it's been fairly common in recent years for some Christians to respond to the, the ecology movement, for instance, negatively. And that we're called to subdue the earth. That means beat it into submission. Good luck saying that to God when you show up. Because he told us to care for his creation. Subdue it doesn't mean crush it until it looks the way we want. It means care for it. Yes, be, be, be masters over it. We are the highest point on the food chain, folks. But uh, we have an obligation to care for it, to tend the garden. And I think there are a whole lot of Christians who are going to, you know, the Lord's going to be tempted to smack them upside the head when they appear before the great white throne of judgment purely because of how they treated his world. My opinion. Okay? So, these are some of the reasons we were created, some of the purposes for which humanity was created. Okay? Good with that? Well, let's go to the next question. Of what is humanity made? What is the substance of which we are made? Now, there's some mystery here. Uh, we know we are dust, you know, we, from the dust of the ground we were formed, and then God breathed his breath of life into us, and we became living beings. We're told that. But that, too, that parallel, that dust and breath kind of thing, gives us the understanding that all people have both material, that is physical selves, and immaterial, spiritual parts. Now, our material cells, our flesh and blood beings, make us like all the other created uh, material beings. We do share something with every other creature. Some of the some of the things that make us are the same things that are used in the trees, not entirely, but there is a there is a consistency of the physical world of matter that we are part of. We are created material beings in the world and part of creation in that world. Okay. And, and we always need to recognize that. But then we have also our immaterial selves, our soul or spirit essence, which we're going to talk about, that makes us like God in a way that no other created being is. We believe that we have a spiritual side that no other created being has. Hebrews even tells us that it wasn't for the angels that Jesus came, but for us. Because we have a spiritual aspect that Jesus died for. The angels don't. Okay. Now, of the two, our immaterial soul spirit, I'm using a slash there for a reason because I'm going to get into this in a few minutes in terms of soul spirit, dichotomous, trichotomous, all that stuff. Of the two, our physical material self and our immaterial spiritual self, the immaterial spiritual side is more our true selves. It is our eternal spiritual selves. Our bodies will die. They will decay. Now, they will be resurrected in a perfected way, but as they are now, they will die. Our spirits will never die. Christianity is quite unique amongst the religions of the world in that we believe not only in a spiritual eternal life, which a lot of religions do, we also believe in an eternal existence of our bodies. And that's quite unique. That our bodies, after death, or if the Lord comes back before we die, our bodies will be perfected and be rejoined with our spirits, and that we will be creatures apparently fairly like we are now, only with a heavenly environment, and without the need for glasses and lips. Okay. In that regard, we will be different. Um, George MacDonald. This quote is often attributed to C.S. Lewis wrongly. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote a lot about George MacDonald. George MacDonald is a favorite of his. But... Um, Donald was a Scottish pastor who actually had influence on C.S. Lewis in becoming a Christian. G.K. Chesterton primarily influenced him to become a Christian, but you'll hear this attributed to C.S. Lewis in it's not. It's George MacDonald. Never tell a child, said George MacDonald, you have a soul. Teach him you are a soul. You have a body. You see the difference? Our ultimate essence, our nature, is that we are spiritual beings. That, and we are wearing the skin for now. We are souls. We have bodies. And Lewis, he did talk about the fact that 
We're, he said human beings are amphibious creatures. Amphibious means living in two worlds. You know, frogs are amphibious because they live on land and in water. We're amphibious because we are both spiritual and physical. You know, we have two essences. The, the most permanent of which is our spiritual essence, but we also have a physical body. So we have both. And in that regard, we are amphibians. Alright? Does that make sense? We good with that? Okay, before we get into what, of what parts do we consist and what that means to us, let's take a break. I will mention that um, the, the McDonald quote here, never tell a child you have a soul, teach him you are a soul and you have a body. Not getting that, not understanding that, is at the core of so much human folly. We are so oriented toward trying to satisfy the, the wants and the desires, sometimes even the needs, of our bodies to the complete, not only neglect, but, but contradiction of the things that our souls need. If we really understood that we were souls first, who are wearing a body, it would fundamentally change our priorities. Okay, again, that's why a correct theological anthropology, Christian anthropology, will fundamentally change a lot of what we understand about how we're still live our lives. Ken? One of the best sermons I ever heard describing that was the pastor said, what if we, you could look out and you could not see anybody's body, but all you could see was their soul and their spirit and their spiritual condition. You know, you would see people that were, looked abundantly healthy, but they would be shriveled and almost lifeless. And just everyone would have a totally different viewpoint of the people that they look at. Right. Well, and, and we do believe, because we are material selves as well, you know, we were made from the dust of the earth, from dust you came to dust you will return. You all have heard the story about the little boy who came home from Sunday school and rushed upstairs, looked under his bed, and then ran, ran out in the hall and was screaming, Mom, Mom, come up here really quick! And his mother comes up and goes, what's wrong? He said, well, we were just in Sunday school and they told us from dust we came and to dust will we return. You need to come quick because under my bed, somebody's either coming or going. <laughs> So, you know, we never had dust bunnies, we had dust rhinos, we called them dust rhinos. <laughs> I, I, I think it, it fits in, in terms of the, the Christian anthropology and, and the, that reference to what McGon said here, no, re, no relationship as far as I know. Okay. Uh, Wouldn't be that relationship. The, the, the notion of our relationship with God uh, and body and, and uh, soul is that the body is attached to the ego and when our egos grow and become very enlarged our souls get squished and our relationship with God is is caught in between of that, that ego thing. If we let the ego uh, run our lives then our ability, our soul part, to have the relationship with God is more and more difficult. Right. Similar and to what you said earlier but just the emphasis yeah. on the ego and letting the ego be the one in charge. Correct. In fact, I said we, you know, we're so anxious to satisfy the desires of our body. Well, there's also the desires of our pride. You know, that we want, we do things to satisfy our egos, to satisfy our pride, without the recognition that you know that we have a soul that has moral volition, and that there are other issues than just what's you know what gives me either either good feelings or a sense of power or whatever. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next question on our list of questions as, as Christian anthropologists, and that is, of what parts do we consist? And then also, what we want to talk about then, is there a difference in soul and spirit? And we've talked about this a little bit. The first, um, and, and I should put this on the same slide, I'll get to this in a minute, the first and standard, the usual Christian understanding, <coughs> is, that, is that human beings are made of two parts. There is, as I suggested earlier, the material part, the physical part, which is our body. That was made from the dust. And then there is the soul or spirit, our spiritual immaterial selves, which was given to us by the breath of God that brought life into our dust shells. Now that, that's called a dichotomism. Two parts. Or, do we believe that perhaps there is three parts to a human being? Body is the same, physical material self, but is there a difference between soul and spirit? Some people have proposed, and I'll tell you sort of where this comes from in a minute, that
that our soul is our spiritual self that is able to think, reason, feel, and relate to the world. Whereas our spirit is our spiritual self that is our moral nature, which has free will to choose good and evil, and which is able to relate to God. So one of them is sort of our, the personality with, with the soul, the personality with which we relate to the world. The spirit is our nature that is able to relate to God. Now, um, These two pieces, which I'll, I'll now talk about, are called dichotomous or trichotomous. Dichotomous believes people have two basic parts, body and soul spirit, whichever word you use. Trichotomous is the belief that people have three basic parts, body, soul, and spirit, with a distinction made between soul and spirit. Two of the verses that are used to, um, let me say first, in the vast majority of cases in scripture, it's clear that soul and spirit are used um, interchangeably. The word soul, that we translate soul, is either a nephesh in Greek or psyche, or a nephesh in Hebrew, or psyche in Greek. The word for spirit um, is pneuma in Greek, or, oh, I just forgot my word. Ruach. Ruach. Ruach in Spanish. Okay? So, or it's Spanish. you saying that. <laughs> Spanish? It's the same thing. No, it's, uh, in, in Hebrew. I studied Hebrew, so okay. Um, and so there are different words. In most cases, they appear to be interchangeable. In many cases, soul is used as sort of a synonym for a human being. Okay, um, that all the souls were gathered together, kind of thing. Now there are at least a couple of verses, however, which suggests that there might be a difference. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is powerful, dividing even soul and spirit, bones and marrow, which suggests that they can be divided, there is some difference. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, make your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we don't really know. We have to have some humility about this. Now, um, again, the majority of people hold to the dichotomous view. And I used to hold clearly the dichotomous view, but more and more I'm beginning to think that there's something to the trichotomous view. Not only because these verses, it's almost as though by the, by the nature of there being exceptions, which seem to clearly say that soul and spirit are not exactly the same thing, any exception would, would cause you at least to ask the question, right? And this is going to sound a funny one. I've mentioned this before. What is the difference between human beings and higher forms of animals? I mean, if you've ever had a dog that you knew well, or I don't know, a chimpanzee or whatever else, but especially a dog, and the sense that they do have a personality, you know, they've got some kind of, there's some spark there. They're not just a little bag of meat and bones. There's something else going on, and yet, we do not believe that they have a spirit in the same way that they, you know, are going to are damned to hell or can be saved by Jesus or, you know, we, we don't evangelize the dogs. But there is something there that's more than just an inanimate being. More than just some, or, or more than just an inanimate being. More than just something that moves around, you know, that, that eats an enormous amount and has to go outside a lot. There's something else there. Do you see what I mean by that? Those of you who have dogs yes. that you related to? Yes. That, that experiential part, I'm not arguing this from, there are, there are parts of scripture that suggest there are three parts, but one of the things that the trichotomous view says is that animals do have something, they have personalities. They have, I mean, if we, if we say that the, the soul is the part of us that is able to think, feel, relate to the world, then animals can do those things. But they can't relate to God in the same way. You know, I, don't, I don't know anybody who believes that. And so, is there a difference? Is it that soul, if that's the part of us that can think and feel and relate to the world, with a personality, because every animal has a different personality. If you've never had animals, you may not realize that. Carolyn had never had a pet until we got married and we got dogs, and she said, I never realized that animals really have distinct personalities. They're very different. Well, the trichotomous view would suggest that the soul is that personality that even animals can have. The spirit is that part of us that is the moral 
in all the ways in which we're made in the image of God and can relate to God. You see, I'm not asking you to accept that. I'm just saying you sort of see where that argument comes from. Yes, Mike. My understanding was that in the garden, and I was taught this somewhere, I don't remember where, that there was a severance between the soul and the spirit that occurred at the, on the, at the fall. And that the unity that it had once been had separated at that point in time. And that, that, and that the Holy Spirit acts to uni reunify. I, I've never heard that. I'd have to think about it. I mean, you know, just on the surface of it, there, that, there may be an aspect of brokenness that, in other words, our, our, our personalities, our ability to relate to the world, got broken off from our spiritual side, they can relate to God at that point, whereas we were all a unity before that. John? Well, is the difference basically attributed to the Hebrew thought versus the Greek thought? You know, the, the, the Hebrews thought it was just body and soul, and then later, as the New Testament was written, and there was influence in Greek, I think you taught this in another class, yeah. that this was, uh, this was more elaborated upon and discovered and well, some people would even say the dichotomous, the view of the body and soul as being different things, is Greek and not Hebrew. That the Hebrews perceive them, perceive persons. There's a third view, which is called monism. And the monistic view is that the body and soul are one thing that may be reflected in, in you know, that the two facets of the same thing would be a good way to say that. Rather than two different essences that are combined, monism says that it is one essence that reflects itself in two different facets that can be perceived. Now, um, some people would say, and I think this is justified, that that is probably closer to the ancient Hebrew view, that, that people were whole units, not this idea. That's why there, there was not a highly developed Hebrew idea of an afterlife. Okay? There is, there's, there's touches of it about Sheol and all that, but there is not a clear sense in which the, you know, the the eternal existence of the soul and the afterlife and where it goes. That's very sketchy in Hebrew thought. And it's because they didn't have as clear a sense of human beings being of you know, body and soul as separate essences that are combined. Now, that idea of monism has been advocated since then by Bultmann, Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, <laughs> Bultmann is one of those Germans, Bob. One of those Germans that has caused all kinds of problems, and Kuhlmann, who came after him, has advocated this. Actually, the idea of monism, I'll get to you in just a second, Ken. Uh, don't want to wear your arm out. Uh, monism, the idea that we are one thing with different facets, is the official doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So there's some churches that hold this. Now that has other theological ramifications. For instance, if you believe that the body and soul are one thing, that just get, we perceive different facets of the one thing, that affects what we think happens after we die. For instance, the Seventh-day Adventists advocate soul sleep. That when you die and your body is put in the ground, your soul is asleep because the body and the soul can't be separated. They're not two separate things. The traditional Christian view is that when you die, your body is buried until the time of the Second Coming, at which point it will be physically resurrected, but that your soul goes on to its eternal reward. Now, I've never found in Scripture where it says, that those who are not in the Lord will be will spend time in hell, but that is, you know, like the Westminster Confession says that, that the, that when you die, the soul of those who are righteous in the Lord will be with him in heaven, and then later will be rejoined with their bodies, and those who are not in the Lord, those who are reprobate, will you know, get a taste of hell until Jesus comes back and we have the final judgment. I haven't found the taste of hell part of it, and so I've always thought there may be actually a soul sleep for those who are reprobate that are not saved. But it is clear, it seems, from Scripture, that those who are saved will be with the Lord, to the, the thief on the cross. This day you will be with me in paradise. Okay? So, that, but the Seventh-day Adventists, because they don't believe in the separation of the body and the spirit, they believe, or soul, they believe it's one, they believe in soul sleep. Everybody, you know, did you die and you wait both soul and body until the Lord returns. Okay? So it does make a difference in terms of perception. Now, that monism is much more an ancient Hebrew idea, whereas the separation of the body and the, and the spirit, or the spiritual side, is much more Platonic and therefore Greek. Why? Because they saw the spirit as good and the body as bad. I mean, Greek thought very clearly differentiated between the two because they thought the physical world was an unfortunate necessity 
but was not good. The spirit was good. To the point that they would say, you know, Pythagoras, you know Pythagoras, the mathematician Pythagorean theorem? Um, this is a fact. I'm not just trying to be crude here. He advocated eating a lot of beans because he believed that flatulence, when you, when you flatulated, <laughs> You gave off little bits of your spirit, and then it was elevated to the spiritual plane, and ultimately all of you would join that. I am not making that up. Because he, he saw that Pythagoras was consistent, or another great thought, that the body was bad, the spirit was good, and when you flatulated, you were giving off little pieces of your spirit to the you know to be joined with the you know, the ultimate spirit. What book is that in? <laughs> Pythagoras. Seriously. Okay, now I've lost you. But again, the idea is the Greek idea, and I should have put it up here probably, of monism. Probably ancient, uh, or the Greek idea is, is uh, the dichotomism that the more more consistent with the Hebrew thought would be the one essence kind of thing. But that's not to say that. That, that ha that's necessarily right. As I say, they did not have a well-developed theology of the existence of the body and the spirit in the Old Testament, which is why you don't... And, and that's why, by the time you get the, to the, the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and Sadducees disagreed over whether or not there was resurrection of the dead. In fact, whether there was an afterlife at all. The Pharisees believed in an afterlife. They believed in resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees did not. Well, the Sadducees could get away with that, because there's not a strong theological stance taken on that issue in the Old Testament. Okay, Florette? Oh, then how does that relate to cremation? Uh, well, the cremation... Yeah, Maybe you be have, no longer have a body. You'd be astonished how many times I get asked that question. Um, <laughs> really, and my mother, when I, when I first got my driver's license and on the back I had an organ donor card, she pleaded with me not to donate my organs because I all needed to be together when the Lord came down. <laughs> um, <laughs> The God who made us from the dust can remake us from the cremated ash, is the simple answer. Yes. Okay. Our resurrected body is going to be perfected anyway. You know, there's not going to be the limitations we experience now, of old age or disease or, or you know, presbyopianism or anything else. And so, presbyopianism is farsightedness. And so, elder vision, literally. And so, all of those things are going to be corrected. God can just as well bring us back from cremated ash as he can make us from the dust of the earth. So there's no reason why we should be fearful of cremation. Okay? And, and isn't it uh, certain religions that believe that you should not be cremated? Yes, there are. Yeah. You know, um, Ken, you've been waiting a long time. Um, two, two things. One, Ecclesiastes 3.21, when you were talking about the spirit of the human spirit of the animal, where the question is asked, who knows if the human spirit rises up and if the spirit of the animal goes down? That's a clue. Just this. That's a mention of... It suggests that there is some spiritual component to animals. Okay. And the second, when you talk about the only evidence that could possibly be used as evidence is, would be the rich man and Lazarus, and whether or not that would be considered a parable, or if that would be considered a true story, right. as to whether someone's going immediately to torment or, or not. Yeah. Well, that story could raise a whole lot of questions, because right. Lazarus is is in hell and the righteous poor man is standing with Father Abraham in heaven. Yeah. Father Abraham's in heaven. You know, and you get into the whole thing about the, you know, the righteous of the Old Testament and what happened to them and where they are. So there are a lot of questions raised by that, whether it is a parable or whatever. Right? Isn't First there, and then isn't there a distinction drawn between paradise and heaven? In some circles that they say that paradise was a holding a holding block for the, the righteous of the Old Testament? Um I mean, I've, I've obviously heard of paradise. Um, I, I, I heard that there was a distinction between the two. I'm not aware of that. Purgatory. That, was the, that was the basis of Catholic Catholicism's purgatory. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's paradise as a doctrine in a number of other religions, Islam would be one of them, you know, one of the particular ones. But um, in terms of that being a holding place, I'm not aware of that. The Church Christ did have some type of teaching on that, but to be honest, I couldn't explain it. Yeah, I'm sure they probably couldn't either. <laughs> okay, any other questions about that? Again, the, I'm not arguing for either one. We don't know, and it doesn't make a huge difference. Lynn, I'm sorry. I That's you. okay. Um, in another time in my life, I was a palliative care nurse, and so spent many 
nights and days sitting with people who are dying. And it certainly makes you have questions and thoughts about these things we've been talking about today. And um, I can only say that as to the discussion between soul and spirit, if you've never sat with somebody uh, for a period of time before their death and then after their death, uh, then find an opportunity uh, and experience because some answers will come to you that are uh, like a shoe fit right or don't fit right and uh, you can maybe have a different insight or a different thought because you are in a different place in your own life because okay. you're, you, you become very close to that person who is that. Okay. So it, it does offer food for that. Marvin? Just <clears throat> back to the thief on the cross. Jesus said to him, this day thou shalt be in paradise with me, but three days later he said to Mary, don't touch me because I'm not going to send it to the Father. So it sounds like paradise is not with God. Yeah, it's well. You know, the doctrine is that Jesus descended into hell and he was not telling the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in hell. You know, we'll be on the road. <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's a limit to how far we can take that in terms of literal interpretation of those things. But the indication, I mean, he didn't say to the thief on the cross, you know, this day you're going to die and at some point in your distant future, we'll see you again. He doesn't say that. There is a sense of immediacy to what he says to the, to, to the thief on the cross, whether, you know, whether the particulars of three days in hell and then, you know, whatever. So yeah. we don't know that. Anyway, okay. So we've talked about whether it's dichotomous or trichotomous. We don't know for sure. But it's it's worthwhile thinking about those differences. Okay. Whether Wherever you land on it is okay. Because this is not a salvation issue. It's not like you're going to be theologically really messed up if you go in one direction or the other. Again, people of good faith, Christian people of good faith, disagree on this. And you can argue either side, which is why we have to be humble about it. Now, when we say, of what parts do we consist, is there a difference in soul and spirit, we then come to the question, where do our souls, or spirits, whichever way you want to look at that, whether it's dichotomous or trichotomous, our spiritual side, where does it come from? Um, there are differences, and again, some of these differences, there are lines drawn in terms of denominational interpretation. Certainly there are lines drawn in terms of historic figures between two options, creationism and traducianism. Creationism says that every soul is newly created by God as needed upon conception of a new baby in the womb. A mother and father conceive a child. Where does that child's soul come from? Creationism says God creates a new soul every time it's needed. Now, there's a couple of, of problems with that one. Oh, I'll get back to that. Let's say, traducianism is a different idea. Traducianism uh, says that the soul is created by the union of the mother and father in the same way that the physical body is created. I mean, let's face it, the creation of a physical baby <coughs> is a big enough mystery. It's not that much farther of a push to say that the soul comes along with the deal. Now, both of these have things to credit them and that create problems. Particularly, um, creationism has the advantage of keeping the creation of our spirit, spiritual sides, in God's hands. It takes it completely out of human hands. And there's some advantage to recognizing that God is entirely responsible for the creation of each new soul. However, in Genesis 2, we're told that God's creation was completed. And we're told that he made Adam of the dust of the earth and breathed life into him, we have no record of him ever doing that again. Right? He didn't repeat that process after that. Um, and so there are questions about that. And the biggest question about creationism is, well, where does original sin come in? Because sin, in terms of original sin, is seen as a sickness of not just the body, which the mother and father create, but is also a sickness of the soul. It's a spiritual ill sickness as well. Traducianism has the advantage to traducianism is that when we, if we say that the mother and father are responsible for not only creating the physical part of the baby, the body, but also the spiritual is somehow a product of the joining of a mother and father and conceiving a baby, 
then that gives us a fairly easy explanation for saying where does the original sin come from in a new baby? Well, it is inherited from the parents in a very literal way, both in the body and in the spirit. You see that? People have differed on these two, including, you know, Luther and Calvin were on opposite sides of this and various others. Um, the creationism is the more popular of the ideas amongst theologians. I tend to follow in traditionism simply for the very simple reason that it seems to me a much more uh, logical explanation for original sin. We don't, because we believe original sin is a spiritual illness, not just a physical illness, then creationism has a problem kind of explaining that to me. Now, the, the advantage, and you can go either way with this. Again, this is, not a, this is not an issue that affects your salvation. The biggest thing that, that's important about these is both of these credit, or both of these propose that a soul is created at the point in which conception occurs. Whether God makes it and introduces it, or it's a product of a mother and father creating, you know, in the same way that they do the body. A new soul is presented. There is a third option. There's always a third option. <laughs> and just like monism is an option over, over the first, over the, the other ideas we had. Uh, here, the third option is pre-existentialism, which means there is a great warehouse somewhere in the heavens where souls live. And whenever a baby is conceived, God sends one out. Pre-existentialism, which some theologians, like Origen, Origen had some problems. Uh, it did some good stuff too, but you know, he's, he's the one I told you that finally had to reluctantly agree that women had souls. Um, Origen is one of the early church fathers that maintained pre-existentialism, that God had made all of the souls that would ever be needed in advance, and they were warehoused somewhere, and they just used them as they're needed. Unfortunately, pre-existentialism frequently is linked to transmigration of the soul. You know what that means? Reincarnation. Transmigration of the soul means that the soul migrates from one physical person to another after death. Well, the idea of pre-existentialism, that there's a warehouse full of souls somewhere that get assigned when a new baby is, is conceived, is quite frequently linked to the fact that the souls that are in that warehouse previously existed in a body and then went there, you know, when time out, they go to the warehouse and they come back to another body later. Transmigration of the soul is not consistent with Christian doctrine. We do not believe that souls exist in multiple people over time. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So the advantage that creationism and traducianism, you can really hold it either one, because they are, they are, in, they are alike in a very critical way, and that is that they believe that at the point of conception, a new soul is delivered, whether it is a product of the mother and father or that God creates a new soul each time, and is fundamentally different than the non-Christian doctrine of pre-existentialism. By the way, Origen maintained that. Later on, the church decided it wasn't right, you know, that that was not the correct doctrine. Is that clear? So we don't know exactly. If these are the two explanations that are common. And Without, without rancor, people of goodwill dis differ on that one. As I say, the dominant one is creationism. I tend to lean toward traducianism. Shall we take a vote? Okay. Any questions about that? Yes? Well, as I look at this, <clears throat> only God can create the soul. Amen. So... You sure about that? What does it say that? Because he creates all things. Well, we get into the question of second causes then. Now, you can say God creates every new baby, mm -hmm. but how does he do it? Through a mother and father. Mm -hmm. The mother and father are the second causes. God is the first cause, the prime mover. But God works through second causes, which include people. I mean, mm -hmm. the seeds from last year's corn crop 
produce next year's corn crop. But the second cause is not the cause of the creation. Well, no, but again, God God creates through second causes. I mean, you know, you read Genesis and it, that, that's it. That, you just said that. Yeah. God creates through the through second the second cause. causes. That's why yeah. the second causes, not the first cause. Right. So, but God works through a mother and father joining together to conceive a child, and that baby is born because of a mother and father's conception. The question is, does that conception, does that God working through the second causes of a mother and father, is it only the body and then God has to interject a soul? Or is a soul part of what a, a God works through the mother and father to create at that point? That's the question. It sounds the same to me. <laughs> because God is, God is involved in the creation either way. Mm -hmm. Well, the issue here, creationism says babies are a direct product of the first cause, God. Mm -hmm. Traditionism says, in the same way the bodies of a baby are a product of the second causes, that God, the first cause, works through the second causes to create the physical body of a baby. Traditionism says that's also how God makes souls happen. <laughs> Now, again, there are, there are, that will lead to some theological differences, but none that are catastrophic. Yes. All right? Uh, Ken first. Oh, and I, then, I don't have that one. Okay. Uh, Mike, and then Flora. Traducianism sounds like it would be also a good explanation for the concept of generational curses, perhaps. Well, yeah, when you talk about the transferal of original sin, that sort of trumps everything else. You know, <laughs> that's the ultimate generational curse. And so at that point, yeah. Flora? Well, what about uh, Psalms 139, where he knew every head, uh, hair that would be on your head before you were even born? Right. Th doesn't that mean that he already has you set? So he, you know, it's not a secondary cause. It's he's involved right before you're ever born. Well, he says that says he knows. You know, that's 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 a credit to his omniscience. It doesn't actually address the process by which he does it. See the difference? He does know. I mean, he knows everything about us. And he ultimately is responsible. The first cause is responsible for all of this. But does he work directly in making a soul for a new baby? Or does he allow the mother and father in the act of conception that it is through them that the soul comes? Okay? We, we, you know, we beat that up, but you get the <laughs> idea that these, these issues, not all of which we have absolute answers to, and not all of which are our problems. Still, thinking this way, if it does nothing else, it makes us value exactly. human nature as God made us. And I want to talk in just a minute about why that's so critically important. In fact, why don't I talk about that right now? Great <laughs> idea. The importance of a Christian anthropology. Every culture that has ever existed, that we know of, that we've discovered, has had some sense that there was something wrong with humanity. Not just asking questions about where we came from. Every culture has had some, some sense that we're broken. That something's not quite right about us. You know, the kids are not all right. Something is wrong. And, you know, it's been pretty obvious because of the nature of crime and injustice and oppression and all the other things that are universally part of human existence. It's not too much of a stretch to recognize something's wrong with us. Sometimes it appears more wrong with some people than others, okay? And, and I wasn't actually snarky at that point, you know. Um, but something is wrong. A clear Christian anthropology is necessary to make sense of who and what we are, who and what humanity is, and what is wrong with us. The essence of sin and evil, fall and redemption. We're going to get into some of those things next week, but as a platform for, for sin, and redemption, for instance, discussion of the fall and redemption, we need to have a basic understanding about who we are as made in the, you know, made in the image of God and what's, what, what are our component parts and all of that, spiritually and physically, etc. But if we don't have a sense of what we are and where we came from, then we cannot get to the point of figuring out what's wrong with us. The Bible gives us a very clear explanation of where we came from, God made us in his image. And what is wrong with us? We were given literally the Garden of Eden, and we violated the trust of the Creator that gave it to us so that we fell from that relationship. And on from there. 
Okay. And yet, if we don't have a con if we don't have those preliminary concepts of what human beings are in relationship to God, none of the rest of that can follow. Is that clear? Yes. Only the fact that humanity was made in the image of God and was created for a unique relationship with God and yet fell from that relationship by disobedience and betrayal, only that gives us a reasonable explanation for what is wrong with us and what can now be done about it. I hope you realize the significance of that statement. That's summing it all up. What's wrong with us and where do we go with it? And that where we go with it is the redemption part that we're going to be talking about. The acceptance of Jesus Christ. Peter Kreeft, a Catholic philosopher and theologian, one written great books, he says this, it is impossible to, uh, to agree on ethics, on how to act, and what is good and not if you disagree about metaphysics, what's the nature of reality, and anthropology. And since ethics is unavoidable, so is anthropology. You can't know what is good for man unless you know what man is. Got it? We cannot evaluate right from wrong in terms of human conduct until we're very clear on what human beings are and why it is that we alone of all creation have the ability to make moral decisions, right and wrong. We have to have a clear Christian, we believe, anthropology in order to go on to the next important parts. And if we don't, the consequences are horrendous. This is my statement. Failure in this regard has been responsible for most of the devastatingly wrong directions humanity has gone in over the last past two centuries. Evolution has led to eugenics. And I'll come back and explain what I mean by these in a minute. Dialectical materialism has that led to communism, with a capital C, that is the communist regimes of the last hundred years. Um, Freudian psychology that led to the sexual revolution, mass infidelity, ST, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and abortion. Now, there are three people responsible for this, these three. They're the big three of our problems. And sometimes they talk about the culture of death, and they are primarily a, a result of Marx and Freud, I'm sorry, Marx, uh, back up, of um, Darwin, Marx, and Freud. When Darwin proposed the theory of evolution, and there's some indication he was not ill-intended when he did that, when he proposed the theory of evolution and people, it sank into people that maybe were just animals, again, this is an anthropological question, that we are just like all the other creatures, that we, like all other creatures, are red in tooth and claw, is an expression that was used, meaning we survive by killing everything else that gets in our way. That eventually led, through survival of the fittest, to eugenics. It led to a lot, a lot of other stuff, too. If we're just animals, then I've got a lot less reluctance killing one of those animals than if I thought that this is a spiritual being made in the very image of God. But eugenics is part of that. Eugenics was the, the policy that was very popular in the 1920s and 30s, the idea that human beings have not only the right, but the responsibility to get rid of all the imperfections in the human race. By breeding them out, which led to mass sterilizations of poor people yes. in a lot of places, or by annihilating them. The ultimate, the, you know, the zenith of the eugenics movement was the Holocaust. Because Adolf Hitler and his henchmen decided that the Jews and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Gypsies and anybody who was mentally retarded and on and on, there's a long list, that they needed to be gotten rid of for the sake of the human race. That is a result, that's eugenics, ultimately. The Holocaust was a program of eugenics, which is purifying the human race, okay, by selective breeding or annihilation or whatever else is necessary. And it was very popular. I mean, it was really, I mean, there were a lot of eugenicists in the United States. When we saw what, where it took us in the Holocaust and the Second World War, all of a sudden it wasn't very popular anymore. But that, it, that was the, the almost inevitable conclusion that came from believing that people are just animals. We breed animals in order to have better animals. Let's do the same thing with people. Or get rid of the ones that aren't going to breed well. Right? That is a direct result 
of the idea and the theory of evolution that human beings are only animals. Then we have dialectical materialism. If you don't know that term, it's Marxism. When Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and others, but especially Marx, when he decided human beings are at their root units of production. That's what we are. And the only question is, are we going to treat those units of productions in a, production in a way that is, um, is more productive or not? That's dialectical materialism. Materialism means everything is just, there's nothing other than the material world. That's what materialism means. The whole of everything is material. And so dialectical materialism was Marx's conclusion that human beings are units of production, not spiritual, only material. That led us to communism. Who's the greatest mass murderer in history? Stalin. Stalin. Joseph Stalin. By a long shot more than Adolf Hitler. Yes. Stalin is estimated to have killed, intentionally, by starving them to death, etc., over 25 million people. That is the product of communism as it has, was practiced, <coughs> communism with a capital C, <coughs> as a direct result of the conclusions of dialectical materialism, that human beings are only units of production. And if they're not going to be productive, then get rid of them because they're in the way. They're eating food that productive units can be eating. Right? You see the conclusions that are drawn from a wrong idea about what human beings are. And then ultimately, Freudian psychology, where we are ultimately a product of our drives, and our highest of all drives is our sexual drive. There's no spiritual. It's purely, we are animals that respond to urges. Led us to the sexual revolution, to mass infidelity, sexually transmitted diseases, and abortion. And, and, and fatherless children. Well, exactly. When I say mass infidelity, that's, that's part of it. You know, we, you know, we, we reproduce like rabbits because we no longer have a sense that we're anything more than rabbits. <clears throat> Becky? Well, when you, when you start thinking that we're the same as animals, you take away the value of life. That's, yeah, that's the point, yeah. And the whole value. Of and that's why this is all dehumanizing. All of it. No matter what their motivations were, Darwin, Marx, and Freud are three, and they're not the only ones, they're just the ones that have been most obvious, that it's easiest to point to the results. Those three determined that we are only animals of one kind or another. Now, they had different priorities or, or different orientations toward how we were animals and what the issues were related to being animals, but in all three cases, it led to a dehumanizing impact on society that led us to massive destructiveness. You see that? And there are other forces doing exactly the same thing today, all of them related to a wrong anthropology, a wrong theological anthropology, a failure to recognize the spiritual aspect of humanity, that we are not just biological, we are not just material, we are not just physical beings, there is something else about us. And you can't breed us like cattle, you can't annihilate us if we are not being productive and sleep well at night, you can't just Give in to your urges without any moral volition being practiced. Some things are right and some things are wrong. And if it feels good, do it doesn't work. All right? And I think we're beginning to figure that out, although there's still a lot of very bad consequences from that kind of thing. Any questions about that or comments on it? Do you see where I'm going with this? Examples of what a bad theological anthropology or, or no theological anthropology has done to us as a people? Close in prayer. This is why we need to take it seriously. Okay? Any other questions about any of that? That's a real downer, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the downer is, is that that's a prelude to what's, what Scripture indicates will come in the future. Yeah. So those, those are just historical excuses. To augment that and to and to you know pull the brakes off of that because you, you're going to see that uh, if I, if I read scripture correctly you will see that uh, expounded upon many times over and uh, Christians will be on that lower rung of the ladder for eugenics. Well, there will be consequences. 
Yeah, sure. That's you know that's, that's certainly. Certainly. Stalin may have died peacefully, but he woke up to something that exactly was not so peaceful. Yeah. Um, yeah. As an example, okay, and there are consequences, and and many of the consequences, many of the many of the sins of our of our culture, of individual people, but of our culture as a whole, go back to not having a clear sense of what we are as human beings in the image of God. The highest of all, that's one of the reasons that I argue the highest point of creation. Because if we don't have a sense of that, then we start in the wrong direction in terms of our perception of the value of humans. Marvin. Perhaps we can add to mass and develop the STDs and abortion, AIDS in Africa, which is decimated. Yeah. That problem. Well, AIDS is an STD, it's yeah. a sexually transmitted yeah. disease, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a big enough issue, I probably should have listed it too. So. Okay, um, that's it for today.